chapter 1 of James, 26 onwards, we will read, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after the orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So as he was talking about the importance of the word of truth, he would say we are births into the kingdom through the word of truth. And he would say as you look intently at the law, he would even call it the law of freedom. But instead of just looking at it and listening to it, or rather that is important, but he would say that alone is not enough. You have to show it in your works. And that is what he goes on saying. So keep a tight rein on your tongues because otherwise you would be deceiving yourself. Just speaking about the word of God does not or rather will not give fruit in you. We need to be practical people. And that is why he says otherwise your religion would be worthless unless you, what do you do? You look after the orphans and the widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So according to, to him, being polluted by the world is that the world is greedy place, right? But here he would say you need to feed the needy. You know, those are two different things. We don't do all of these things because our own needs are much more important to us and therefore we are greedy people. We will not be thinking about other people's need and that is according to him. Pollution of the world. What is the world full of? Everybody is selfish. We don't t take care of the other people because we don't even consider their needs as something that is important. What comes first? Our need comes first, not other people's needs. So that is the pattern of the world. And he calls it, that is a pollution of the world. That you cannot allow yourself to be polluted by this worldview where I am more important than Others, if you are a person who thinks that you are pious, you're religious, you're following the Lord, and if you're following the law of freedom, then you would be giving importance to others, feeding them, taking care of them. Otherwise, your religion is pointless, is what he would say. All right, we understand his premise as to what he is saying. Chapter 2, verses 1 onwards. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, we must not show favoritism. What is actually happening in James's time, or it could happen even today, or more so today, suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to a man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Who is he writing to? He is writing to supposed Christians. He is writing to Jewish Christians. He is writing to people who claim to follow the Lord and they are meeting together. You get the idea? So he's not talking to a non-believer. He's not talking to people who have nothing to do with Christ. He is talking to people who claim to follow Christ. And what is the church? Church is a gathering of people who claim to follow Jesus. But that claim could be disproved sometimes. Yeah, you, only you know whether you follow him or not. But we believe if you are a part of the church that you follow Christ, right? The idea is that people who claim to follow Christ, yet you find what is there? Favoritism, and it's very surprising. It might not be very surprising for us because we are like favoritism is a part of life, yes? This is the case, this was the case then, unequal treatment of people. This is abhorrent in the eyes of the Lord because the law of freedom, the Old Testament law or any law for that matter, and Jesus sums it up in the New Testament, it is always about right relationship with God and equality among people. If anyone goes against either of these two things, we are guilty of sin and we would be punished. You understand that? Relationship with God, right understanding and right relationship with God and equality of all human beings because everyone is created by God. And if we put people down, then we are in for a surprise. We might claim to know Jesus. We might claim to follow Jesus as these people are. And James is saying, you be very careful because this is not a religion that God, God is going to be happy with you. It's going to be unacceptable in the eyes of God. Be very careful. The rich are venerated. It's not just in those times. Even today, the rich are venerated. Poor are ill-treated. You know, and we know that positions in the church are given to, you know what, the titles, right? We have these elders and deacons and all of those things. It goes to poor people. Who does it go to? 
Usually that's the case. Even today in churches, you know, rich people are given importance. And, and James would be vehemently against that. And, uh, you know, this is the problem of today. Rich become celebrities. You know, whom do you consider a celebrity in Christianity? I mean, can you even call somebody a celebrity in Christianity? Yeah, what do you think? But somehow we have coined up this word. You know that, right? This beautiful word called Christian celebrities. They don't go together. I'm so sorry. They don't go together. You cannot be a celebrity. The only celebrity, if at all you celebrate somebody, you celebrate Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And we are all followers and there is no celebrity among us. And there is no celebrity status, you know. And you cannot venerate people. You cannot put people on a pedestal. You know, pulpit is for sale, yeah? Right? Today, yeah? Pulpit, not this, this, this thing you can buy it for whatever amount. The pulpit, meaning the, you know, the office of the preacher has been sold. You know, you can run churches just because you are a rich person. You know that, right? And that is called running churches, like running a business. You know that, right? You can run churches. People run churches. And people run behind those people who run churches because that's, that's another business, basically. Money becomes the one qualification for everything, for honor, for veneration. You preach the word. It doesn't matter whether you preach it rightly. It matters whether you have money or not, whether you have popularity or not. And a popular person will be heard. No matter what garbage comes out of their mouth, that would be considered doctrine. I'm being, I'm being yeah, very harsh here, but I'm considering, I'm calling it garbage. You know, anything that is non-biblical coming out of celebrity Christians, and you venerate, and you just lap it up. For what? Why? Just because they are up there, because, you know, they are on a, in a celebrity status, you know, just like the superpower, for us, the superpower is money. And James is saying, if that is what you are giving importance to, you are in for a surprise. You have nothing to do with godliness, with religion. You know, if you look at the first chapter, I want you to look at it one more time. It is beautiful. And I want you to see what James is saying. Chapter 1, verse 9. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. Just look at it one more time. Believers in humble circumstances, he is talking about financial humble circumstances or social humble circumstances, ought to take pride in their high position. But the rich, the believers have to take pride in their high position because of their humble circumstances. But the rich, are the rich a part of the believing community? According to James, not according to me, according to James. Did you look at it? I know you would be very angry with James. The believers, but the rich. This rich, are, are they a part of the believing community? We are not bashing rich people just because of the riches. But look at that. Look at the whole of society. Look at Jesus' times. Was he a pro-rich or was he an anti-rich? We don't like this Jesus, I know. This historical Jesus, we don't like it. This Jesus we like is like, you will be a billionaire. And immediately you burst out with a hallelujah. Right? Right after you walk out of the church, Jesus is going to bless you and you are going to be, you know, the topmost or the you know, richest person in the world. You burst out with hallelujah and you would be very, very happy with me. And you would say, this is the best church in the world. You would give me a very fat offering. Yes? Jesus was anti-rich. He would say, it is difficult, it is much more difficult for a rich person to enter into the kingdom than the camel to enter into the eye of a needle. Look at the comparison. Look at the you know, contrasting comparison, if that's a word. And I, the eye of a needle, and later on people wanted to kind of you know, smoothen it out and kind of you know, make it palatable. And they came up with this explanation where they said there is a gate in Jerusalem, you know, which is called the eye of the needle. Historically, it is completely untrue. Archaeologically, it is completely untrue. When Jesus was talking about the eye of a needle, he was actually talking about the eye of that small little needle. You understand that? And he's talking about a camel going through the eye of a needle. He was actually saying, it's not really difficult, it's almost impossible. Not my words. Why is he saying that? Luke chapter 6, he would be going on almost on, the, on a rant against these people. He would say that those who have, you will owe to you. Owe to the rich, he would say. Blessed are the poor, he would say. Why? Because he was not rich. He was not allowed to be rich. Is that why? 
The idea is that we need to understand if you have more than you need, if you have more than other people in your society have, there is something wrong that you might not have exploited people, you might not have killed people, but you have come to that state using an exploitative system. You don't agree with me. You might be in a higher position. You don't have to feel guilty about being in a higher position. But at the same time, understand, it becomes a responsibility that each one of us, if we are standing above the rest of the society, it becomes a responsibility that, what? That we bring other people to our level where you come a little bit down and raise them up. That is the biblical idea. That is the biblical teaching. We don't like that teaching, right? You know what is unthinkable? People dying of starvation is not unthinkable. That's not news. A billionaire becoming less rich, not becoming a pauper, not becoming poor, a billionaire becoming less rich than he was yesterday is news. Do you know that? So what's unthinkable? Not a poor person dying. What's unthinkable? A billionaire? Losing a few dollars. Becoming less rich is unthinkable. This is pollution, according to James. Let the world not pollute you. Hallelujah. Yes, thank you for that. I was not expecting that. Hallelujah. But church is changing. Praise God. He clearly differentiates between the rich and the people who are following him. And chapter 2, we will, we will go on. So he says, you cannot... You cannot consider you know, people uh, with, with, with wealth as somebody who, who, whom you have to venerate. And when you do that, he says, you become evil judges. Verse 4, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So he is saying, you are evil people. You have nothing to do with Jesus, with the church. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised? Those who love him, but you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the one who are dragging you into courts? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? Who are the culprits? Who are the villains? Anybody. You could be a Christian and if ever you want to say, you know, if your desire, someone asks you, what is your desire? Why do you follow Jesus? I want to become a billionaire. You have nothing to do with Jesus. If you want to become rich, what do you want to do? You know, what, your, what our heart's desire should be is that. What should your heart's desire be? What do you pray for? Usually it is basically, uh, yesterday I was down there. I want more. I want more. I want to become higher. I want to grow more. Think about what I have. Think about what can I do with anything that I have more than I need and how I can uplift people if I don't, he says, if you are going after riches, you cannot have two masters, and one is the money. Money is one master, and God is another master. It's not the devil. He's not even talking about the devil. You cannot give importance to these exploitative people. Be a person who considers other people. And if at all our prayer is, yes, I have Lord, I have enough, I'm able to pay my rent, I'm able to feed myself, I'm able to feed my family. Yeah, yeah, anything more. I want to do something to help other people. Then you are a part of the kingdom, let me tell you. You are a part of the teachings. You definitely know the teachings of Jesus Christ. Other, otherwise, you do not know. So he is saying, these are the ones who are exploiting and making use of you, but how dare you go uh, 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 for them, how dare you venerate them? If you keep the royal law found in the scriptures, it's beautiful. James sometimes uses these beautiful epithets. He calls this law the royal law. Love your neighbor as yourself. Again, this is not something that he is using. He is quoting from Jesus Christ. Earlier, he talked about the law of freedom. It's a beautiful epithet that he coined because law in itself for us is basically restriction of freedom. But here we would call all the law, law of freedom, not for you alone. It brings freedom to everybody. Everybody has a right to live. Today, people don't have right to live. You know that, right? Rich people have a right to live. Rich people have a right to eat, right? Rich people have a right to do anything and everything and, you know, pollute the world and everything. Poor people can do not have the right to live, do not have the right to eat. You know that? They don't have the right to drink pure, uh, clean water. They don't have the right to inhale good air because 
that's the way and he is saying you cannot do that this is the royal law love your neighbor as yourself you and when you do that if you keep the royal law you are doing right but if you show favoritism you sin and are convicted by the law as law breakers so favoritism according to him is sin in the kingdom in the community if someone is given much more importance and priority than somebody else what is he calling that what's that huh yeah it's a sin okay that's a strong word let me tell you he is calling inequality a sin if you are okay with inequality there is no doubt that you are a sinner yeah you understand that inequality is sin and he says you cannot have that to look at today do we have sin do we like you know the royal law is love others as you love ourselves and even that has been completely mis misinterpreted today people even say you know unless you love yourself how can you love other people so the first priority is what i have heard people use this royal law to make it so selfish they say yeah this is what jesus taught love your love your uh, love your neighbors as you love yourself then they turn it around and say if you are not able to love yourself how will you love other people so what do we concentrate on loving yourself pamper yourself reward yourself these are beautiful words sound very good motivation right all motivational speeches let me tell you boil down to this and only this it's all about you you are god you are everything nothing else matters that's all motivation speech right any motivational speech do a research it's all about me it's but me me it's completely against what jesus has taught and it is completely against what christianity stands for and he says if you do that what do you do you become a law breaker for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it so he says you break one law you break all the laws if you're saying you know what i'm doing everything good but this inequality concept i'm not okay with or equality concept i'm not okay with he says you break all the laws and you would be condemned as a sinner for he who says you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder if you do not commit adultery but do commit murder you have become a law breaker so if there is inequality is there inequality in your mind it could be economic inequality financial inequality which is very prevalent in churches today right and that is why we as a church are working towards you know bringing equality at least among the people of god that there should not be anyone who has nothing to eat let me tell you i assure anybody you know anybody that i ever meet here in our church we make a promise nobody in our church will go out go without food or the or the basic necessities of life and the church will take care of you if you go through that because that's something if you are not able to take care of that don't ever claim to be a christian don't ever claim to be a christian and he says inequality if that is you you say hey that's the natural order that's how god created that is against god people dare saying that people dare to say that people say why are people you know uh, uh, suffering why are people in poverty why are people you, you know uh, they don't have anything and you have the audacity to say it's all the lord's will that's a very spiritual answer what it's all the lord's will what can i do god made me rich god gave me everything god didn't give you anything what do you do you ask god he will give you and that is inequality is it just financial what about caste system is that isn't that inequality i'm a very good christian you see i follow the bible but when it comes to marriage please excuse there is something there right particular caste there which are which are within a bracket please excuse are the castes i'm okay with please excuse this caste why is it there in your profile why are you looking for this you know and uh, pastors right pastors kids yeah i'm okay with everything preferably this particular caste really and you are a christian isn't that inequality you are talking about hey i'm completely away from the world he is saying polluted you are polluted in the world because pollution that is pollution you know where that comes from that comes from varnashrama dharma it has nothing to do with christianity let me tell you where does caste system come from varnashrama dharma and it has nothing to do with christianity 
How dare you use some kind of a, you know, non-Christian, a pagan philosophy to justify what you are doing? And James would say, you claim to be religious, let me tell you, it's an abhorrence in the eyes of God. You have inequality? It's an abhorrence, it's a sin. May the Lord help us that we will not. What about racism? Do we have racism? We have casteism? We have sexism? You know, is there gender inequality? Yeah, that, that, that is biblical sanction, right? Gender inequality, yeah. God already commanded, 10th commandment, do not covet your neighbor's house or you do not covet your neighbor's wife or any of those belongings, right? So that automatically means that the wife belongs to the husband, yes? No? 10th commandment, you've not read it. Okay, go home and read it, okay. So if you are born a male, that means the woman belongs to you meaning that you have ownership according to the 10th command, commandment. Okay, you're looking at me like, what is he trying to say? Yeah, that's, 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 as Jesus would say, because of their rebelliousness, because of their, he would use another beautiful word, I think because of their stiff nakedness or something like that, Jesus would say, that is why, because of their callousness of their heart, callousness, right, meaning that it's become a hard heart, Moses gave you that. Yeah, God is the one who gives through Moses, but he escapes by saying, putting all the blame on, Moses, I didn't say that. Moses said that because of your hardness of heart, right? In fact, because of the hardness of heart, God gave it through Moses, right? And because at that point of time, they are so hard and you cannot make it soft immediately. So you, you know, wait for some time, you soak it in water and after some time, it you know, slowly they are able to understand. So Jesus' time, he has completely broken this concept of inequality and he says equality of gender, equality of status, equality of race, equality of nations. You understand that? Israel is not the nation which is close to God. How many of you had been to Israel? To the Holy Land. You've been to the Holy Land? Okay, what is holy about that? It's just another piece of land. No? It is holy. Where Jesus walked. Isn't God everywhere? God is everywhere. It's a historical place where Jesus was. You go in, if at all you want to, you got a lot of money. You go, okay, this is where Jesus lived. This is, but you, you still you do not know where Jesus lived, do you? Someone says that after 2,000 years. Did he live? Okay, yes, he lived. <laughs> Did he die? Yes. Did he, was he buried? Yes, he was. Right. If we were there, we would have immediately captured everything, put a fence everywhere he goes. He walked there. Yes, you put a fence there. Nobody comes in, you pay $100, then you can enter that. Yes? Yes, no? Because that's, hey, Jesus walked on that, man. Right? Nobody cared. The first century Christians did not care about where Jesus walked, where he slept, where he, you know, was staying. No, no, no. They wanted to tell the world, Jesus is God and he is for you. He is for everybody. And therefore, it's got historical significance, but it has no religious significance. Kerala is not God's own country. Israel is God's own country because, yes, Israel belongs to God. As though he did not create India, as though he did not create any other nation, he created every nation. Hallelujah. Praise God. So there is no inequality. Do we have inequality in our mind? James says, I'm sorry, you have nothing to do with the kingdom. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Beautiful. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. If you are not able to consider other people you, your equals, then I'm sorry to say that you have no part in the kingdom. You will be judged without mercy. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? This is the, you know, problematic statement because it looks like he is promoting salvation based on deeds. Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Is he saying that you cannot be saved without works? Is he saying that? Isn't Jesus saying something very similar to that in Matthew chapter 25? 
about the goat and the, the sheep and the goats. There, Jesus would say that there is the sheep, there is the goats. And who are these goats? Who are these sheep? He would say, you fed me when I was hungry. You gave me drink when I was thirsty. You clothed me when I was naked. You, you, you visited me when I was in prison. And therefore, you have eternal life. He says that. Jesus says that. And he says to these people who are claiming, Lord, and he would say, but you did not do any of those things for me and you will be eternally damned. Yes. So, again, James is kind of taking that. So, if you take just this passage and take that passage alone, then obviously you will come to the conclusion that even Jesus, right, when, when he said that, Matthew chapter 25, yeah, 25, 31 to 46. He would say the same thing, almost. That, so he doesn't talk about faith there. He's actually talking about works. The idea is that faith and works are so related. Yes, faith comes first and deeds come next. It should not be the other way around. It, should, it, cannot, it can never be, oh, I'm a very good person. I've been a very, I'm a philanthropist. I go about helping people all the time. But I have no relationship with God. You have no eternity at all. That's very, very clear. The Bible teaches that. Yes? But at the same time, we believe in Jesus Christ. I am a sinner and I cannot do anything about my, sinful, my, my sinfulness and therefore I can never be considered righteous but, and therefore I need his sacrifice, his righteousness that Jesus Christ gave to me as he died on the cross. Yes, so I'm saved by? By faith. Because of his grace, I'm saved by faith in Jesus Christ as my savior, as the Lord, right? But at the same time, faith doesn't stop with just that. It, in, and, and it is so interlinked that the immediate result of my faith is action. If there is no action, that is what James is saying. He is even doubting their salvation. He is questioning their salvation because these people are saying they are claiming to be followers of Christ. They are in the church, yes. Our salvation is based on faith, no doubts there. But the immediate result of my salvation, of my faith is in action. And he is saying, he is even questioning their salvation. If you are saved, then why is there inequality among you? Why is there favoritism among you? Why are the poor still there in the church? If the poor are still there, that means you have not understood Christ. You have not, how dare you say that you are saved? Because if you are saved, what is salvation? Basically, my relationship back with God, right? Reconciliation with God. If I have been reconciled with God and his law and his teachings have always been about equality, and if I am connected with him, if I am not able to do the least to help somebody, can I even call myself sick? So, so when you look at the context of what he is saying, we understand that he is not actually saying that our salvation is not by faith, but he is saying my faith is expressed through my deeds. If I don't have deeds, how can I even say that I am saved? That is the question. That's a good question, right? So you don't believe in Salvation by works. We don't believe in salvation by works. We need to be very clear. And Martin Luther, the reformed reformers, came up with these three sola phrases, right? You know about the sola scriptura, when Martin Luther and the, and the company, they said, only by scripture. We will not believe anything except the scripture. Sola scriptura. They said sola gratia, meaning only by grace, not by works. And they also said sola fide, which is only by faith. These sola, these three sola phrases, which we need to know as a Christian, if you are a, if you are a Bible-believing Christian, if you are a saved person, you need to know that we believe only the scripture. We believe only in the grace of God, not our works. We believe only in having faith in Jesus Christ through which we are saved, okay? So these are not negated, just like Jesus is not negating those things in Matthew chapter 25, but rather he is elaborating on that and he's talking about the practical application, all right? So he is saying faith and deeds. So I call it exercise of faith. If the first one, we would call it equality of all, which he is talking about. Equality of all is essential. Then he's talking about exercising your faith, right? Today, exercising faith is all about what? I claim the promises that belong to Abraham. Abraham already claimed it. You can't. <laughs> you understand that? It's almost like, you know, using the same, uh, you know, entry pass again and again. Someone bought it. Oh, he has already entered. You have no claim over that. You understand that? Yeah. I claim the promises given to Abraham. That's, that's our faith, the statement of faith. What is your statement of faith? It's no more, you know, what, what, uh, who God is. It's no more the Apostle Creed. Do you know the Apostles' Creed? Right, that's the declaration of faith. But when you ask a Christian today, what's your faith? 
I believe that Jesus is going to do great things for me. So he did very little on the cross. That means nothing at all. Salvation he gave you, he gave you oneness with him, reconciliation with him, that's all nothing. He's going to do great things, greater things than that. What greater thing than that? Yeah? That's my statement of faith. So when I wanted to say, exercising your faith, I need to be very clear. Because, uh, yes, everything could be misconstrued today. Exercising my faith is, I believe, I believe God is going to do this. I believe God is going to do that. Here, the exercise of faith is not that. How my faith is going to be useful for other people. If I am having favoritism in my mind, inequality, if I'm a person who doesn't care about other people, and that is, these are all these people very, are very, very, they show themselves to be very spiritual people. Look at them. They say to them, what? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. You know the situation. They have no food. They have no clothes to wear to keep themselves warm. And you, one of you, one of the church members, one of the so-called Christian goes and says, go in peace. Keep warm and well fed. What is that? Yes. You know they are in need. And you say, shalom. You will not lift a finger to make that shalom possible for them. But you go and say, shalom, everything be well with you. May your soul flourish just like, or rather, may you flourish just like your soul flourishes. You will take all those, you know, promises from the Bible and quote it to them. That quote is not going to feed them. That scripture is not going to feed them. Let me tell you. No. That's what James is saying. Okay. If you, want, if you have a problem... Whom do you take it up with? Whom do you take it up with? With James. If you have a problem with this preaching, whom do you take it up with? Not this Pavam guy who's just the messenger, <laughs> but the one who is the source of the message. I'm not demeaning James. I'm saying this is something that is important. All right, so go in peace, keep warm, just like we say, oh, I'll pray for you. God will help you with this. Such an easy excuse, such an easy way to escape your responsibility, going and telling people who are without food, the Lord will feed you. He, didn't he feed Elijah? That's, that's, that. Yeah, we quote the scripture. We know the scripture, yes? Didn't, he, didn't God uh, uh, feed Elijah with ravens? He will definitely feed you. So very consoling, yes? When you are hungry, someone comes to you and says, God fed Elijah. God gave manna to the people. God multiplied everything and 5,000 people were, were, were able to eat. It's going to console you. You're going to eat those promises. He is saying how unspiritual you are, yet you claim to be so spiritual with your words. In the same way, faith itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So he is not saying faith is dead. He's saying faith, if it is not accompanied by action, which again tells us the order of things, faith accompanied by its, yes, by the actions. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds. That's the basic thing he's saying. I cannot show my faith without my deeds. So if someone asks me, how do I show my faith? By my deeds. And I will show you my faith with my deeds. You believe that God is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that. So he's saying, if you are called believers, just because you believe in God, let me tell you, you have better believers. Who are the believers? Better believers. Demons. They believed in God right even before you believed in God. So, who's senior in belie being a believer? <laughs> yeah. The demons are better believers than you. So, no, no, no uh, justification saying, I'm a believer. Right? You foolish person. Can he be stronger than this? You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friends. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Again, that is what, if you take it out of context, it would mean that faith alone is not good enough, but he's saying faith, but yeah, faith is there. But what is the next thing? If, if there is no words, if there is no works, if there is no deeds, your faith is completely dead. And he is quoting Abraham. Why is he quoting Abraham? Just like Paul would quote Abraham too. Again, when you look at it, you would, you would, you would think about when you look at the book of Romans, the same thing Paul would use 
to go against the Judaizers who are saying works are what saves you, he would use the same thing. Paul would use the same thing, but he would be talking about we are saved by faith alone and not by the deeds of the law, right? The same quote. But yeah, he would say, the same quote he would say, but his faith did not end with faith. It led to his deeds. So in that context, we will not call James a heretic, okay? So in that context, you know, we, don't, we understand that he's not negating salvation by faith alone, because if he had done that, then he would not be an apostle at all. He would be immediately, you know, he would, be, he would have been called a heretic. So we understand sometimes it might seem so, but when you look at the book and you know that the first century Christians accepted this book and they were much better Christians than we were in the sense of most of them at least had a proper understanding of God and the right teachings from the apostles themselves. And as Paul and all of those things, Paul was a contemporary of James, you understand that? And James was considered to be a leader in the church, and if Paul had differed from James in terms of this theology or the soteriology, then he would not have had any qualms raising his voice against James, just like he did for Peter, not the uh, uh, doctrinal thing, but the practical thing, yes? He did not, he was not scared of Peter, even though Peter was a well-established figure at that point of time, you know that, right? So Paul would say, Peter, you did wrong when you went and, uh, uh, when you were eating with the Gentiles and when the Jews came, you know, you were associating yourself with them. So Paul was having harsh words and, you know, these words with, with Peter, and if this was a wrong doctrine, then everybody would have stood again. So historically and context, we will understand what James is saying. So he's not, he He's not contradicting sola fide. And in the same way, he also uses another reference of Rahab and how she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a direction. And she also became a part of Israel by her deeds, right? So at that point of time, we know that anybody who is acknowledging Israel, they were also acknowledging the God of Israel. And now Rahab has uh, acknowledged the God of Israel. And then she is saying, okay, I will help you. And therefore, her faith and her deeds, according to this, according to his thesis, go hand in hand. Exercise of faith. What's the exercise of faith? That my faith in Jesus is what gives me salvation, but the law is always the ideal of God and that is in his mind. If I am closely associated with God, if I reconcile with God, my nature, my character, my deeds will be reflective of what he had taught. And therefore you cannot separate my faith and my deeds, even though I'm saved by faith and not by works. Okay, so we talked about the first one. That is basically the equality of all. Secondly, exercising of faith. And I'm going to go very quickly through the third chapter also, just the first part of it. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. So why is he saying that? Because it's easy to teach. No, people say that. What do they say? People who can, they do. And people who cannot, you've not heard this. People who can, they do. People who cannot, they do become a pastor. <laughs> Jesus would say, go and make disciples, teach, the, uh, teach everywhere. You know, it looks like he is contradicting Jesus, you know, because Jesus is saying, go and teach. And this man says, be very careful, don't become teachers, right? So why is he saying that? It's almost like our pastors will be saying to the crowd, okay, pastor, that's a special calling. You cannot even aspire to become that, okay? So you cannot teach. What you can do? You can serve me. I will teach, I will preach. What do you do? You serve me. Elisha, how did he start off? Elijah, yes, he poured water on the hands of Elijah. Have you ever poured water on my hands when I, after I have eaten? Right. How will you receive the double portion of the anointing? You will not. Okay, yes. So that's a sermon for another day. Some of you who don't get my tone, I was joking. All right. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who's never at fault in what they say is perfect. So he is saying, you know, let your words match your actions. And let you, because it's very easy to speak and speak and speak. And these people are not, uh, they are basically heroes of, uh, not faith, but heroes of speech, I guess. Because they go to the poor and uh, the, uh, uh, um, you know, people without anything and they say, let it be all okay. You go happily. So they are good with words, right? They have nothing indeed. So he is saying, instead of going and using your words, so this is basically hypocrisy. That is what he is mentioning. Hypocrisy, words without action, just like faith without action. Words without action is hypocrisy. I show that I love you very much by my, yes, professing of love is different from 
the action of love, right? It's very easy to profess love. Oh, I love everybody, right? I love all the rich, the poor equally. But when it comes to action, no, I don't. Hypocrisy, he says. We all stumble, right? When we put bits in the mouth of horses to make them obey, so he would be talking about, he is using imagery. Here he is saying about the horse that, uh, you know, there is a bit which is put on its mouth so that it can be made to obey. He is talking about a ship which which is uh, driven, which has been directed, which has been steered by this small rudder, and he is comparing the tongue to it. Likewise, in verse 5, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. So he's not talking about any kind of a speech. He's talking about boastful speech, as though you are the most spiritual person in the world, as though you are the ardent follower of Jesus Christ. You boast about that, but in fact, you don't do a thing. It's a hypocritical speech, and he says, this kind of a tongue... It is like a fire in a great forest. Verse 6, the tongue also is fire, a world of evil. As I said, he's got a way with his words. Beautiful. What is he saying? He is a poet, yes. A world of evil. He calls the tongue a world of evil. And he would also say, yeah, it, would, uh, it corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and itself set on fire by hell. So it will be destroyed. So he is actually... Quoting, kind of Jesus Christ, right? Jesus Christ would be talking about the I, which is, if it is corrupted, it corrupts the whole body. The same way, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, sea creatures, and everything is tamed, but what cannot be tamed is the human tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. You know, he is definitely got away with his words. Beautiful. So what is he called it? A world of evil. You would not even be thinking about the tongue that way. It's a restless evil. It's full of deadly poison because you are, you know, in your words, you are the greatest person ever, right? But when it comes to deeds, that, that, that's a completely different thing. It's hypocrisy. He is saying, escape from hypocrisy. Don't be a hypocrite. That is what all he is saying. So may the Lord help us that we would not be, you know, saying, I'm a Christian. I'm a practicing Christian. I follow Jesus. I know the commandments. If you don't put them into practice. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse human beings. So, why do we praise God? Can we praise God and curse people? He also says, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. So, God created human beings, but we love God, we hate human beings. Really? You go to somebody's house and say, I love you very much. And you go about thrashing everything in their house, breaking everything. You say, I love you very much. And you go see a TV, break it. You go see their, their, their fridge, you break it. Their car, you break it. I love you very much, but your belongings, I hate it hypocrisy. Human beings were created by God in his likeness. You say, I love God. I hate human beings. Cannot be reconciled. Cannot be reconciled. That is what he is saying. So words, don't be a hypocrite. It's the same mouth. There comes praise and cursing. And again, he goes on using some imagery, borrowing from nature. Fresh water and salt water flow from the spring, same spring. Can they? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grape wine bear figs, neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. So, who you are is who you, your actions would be, your words would be. There will be no disconnect, otherwise you are a hypocrite. Why do you praise God? Because that would be nothing more than flattery, right? If that is because people today, you know, praise is basically what? The mantra, the chant, every day, Thousand and one praise or hundred and one praise, I have no idea what that is. Okay, if you have those books, what do you do? You burn them at the stake. You know Suprapadam? You know that? The people in the morning, our Hindu neighbors, they will have something and they'll keep on chanting something because that is what? It brings blessing. And what do you do? I, uh, I, you know, I know that is very Hindu, so I'll make it very Christian. What do I do? Thousand and one praise. Let it go on and on and on and on. Because somehow that is, this is not praise. That is kind of trying to exploit God. But let me tell you, he is much wiser than you. He will not get exploited. He is not like human beings. Okay, you can flatter human beings and, uh, you know, get, get good things. You know that, yes? Okay, if not done that, try that. Okay, 
Go and say it to somebody, and you need to talk to a uh, non-logical person. Okay, you, you go and talk to a logical person, they're going to be, you know, that's going to be a completely different thing. Go and talk to somebody and say, oh, great person, I loved your sermon, it was so powerful. You know, these are things that I would expect from you, but still, none of you would say that. This, like, okay, that greatest sermon ever, it came very biblical, you know, I liked it, I'm going to be in this church forever, and immediately I know, okay, so what do you want from me? Okay, flattery will not take you anywhere. God knows it is flattery. Your praise, without helping anybody, your praise doesn't matter. It is basically exploiting God and exploiting people. So he says, escape from flattery. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by the deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. Now he switches over to wisdom and James also beautifully transitions from one to the other and sometimes it might look jarring if you don't know the transition. All that he is saying is if you think that by your words you are proving to people that you are wise, think again, wisdom is not words, wisdom is deeds. And then he is going to talk about other things which we will be looking at the next week. So today we talked about three things. Equality of all, exercising your faith, and I call it escaping from hypocrisy. That's just words and not deeds. And may the Lord help us that we will be able to put it into practice that we would be people who truly follow God and not just claim to follow God. Let's bow down our heads and look to the Lord in prayer.